What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Decap, and welcome back to Black and Queer at the Table, where we're talking about what's new, what's happening, and what's what in LGBTQ culture. Now, y'all, I will say that this is a moment that I am very excited for since it's been confirmed, and I'm glad to finally share it with you all, with all of our people, all of our fans, everyone who's watching and listening. So today, we're joined by the Atlanta-based abolitionist, writer, and community organizer, Deshaun Harrison. They currently serve as managing editor at Wear Your Voice magazine, speaks across the nation on topics such as blackness, queerness, gender, class, disabilities, fatness, and the intersection of them all, and is now the author of the book that everyone's talking about, Belly of the Beast, The Politics of Anti-Fatness as Anti-Blackness. So Deshaun, thank you so much for being here, being, you know, not physically present, but in our space to be able to join us and have this discussion. I've been a fan of your work since I've discovered you about a little over a year ago and just have been watching the things that you've been doing and reading a lot of your different articles and everything. So I'm glad to be able to have this one-on-one with you and just share your knowledge and experience with our people. Oh, no, thank you so much. I'm like really um, happy to like be on here and that you asked me to be a part. Um, I um, I'm like grateful. I'm excited. I'm like looking forward to this interview. So let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to jump right into it for you. Okay. So it's officially been one week since the release of your first book. So congratulations. We love to give our people their flowers while they're here. (laughs) Yes, thank you. It has been one week. It feels like it's not been one week, but it has been. Time goes fast when you enjoy it. (laughs) It does. It really, really, really does. Um, It has been a week, though. So thank you. I really appreciate that. No problem. So within this week and even from the idea conception of it till now, how has the experience been for you? I know the first week of you releasing it has probably been a little overwhelming, but also very exciting. But I'm just also wondering how the experience of coming up with the topic and, you know, doing your research and doing the actual writing and editing and now being a published author, it it must have been a roller coaster of a ride to say the least. To say the least, yes. Like it has been, it, um, like, so the concept for the book originally came in 2018 um, when I was first approached by um, someone who worked for a, a major um, publishing house in New York. Uh, they had They approached me about writing a book. And at the time, you know, like, I was navigating so much. I was like unemployed. I was homeless. I was like forced into survival sex work um, and like really just navigating a bunch of hardship uh, that I just didn't have the time or the capacity to to write the book. Um, And so I think in 2017 is when I discovered like fat studies. And I was like, you know, um, I... I'm finally able to like sort of have language to describe, to, to put into, into words what I'm experiencing. Um, but that language is not providing me with resources. So like I have the language and, and I'm still like out here without the resources that I need to be able to like, you know, actually be able to write this book. So a year went by and I, I didn't write the book. I actually stopped thinking about it. But in the back of my mind, I was always like, dang, I wonder what, like, you know, what could have happened if I was able to write the book. And I, I, I just was disappointed that I, that I wasn't able to. And then in 2019, um, towards the end of the year, um, I got an email. Actually, funny enough, the email actually came in the, in the middle of 2019, but I was experiencing like some, some weird stuff with my email to where I wasn't getting emails and I didn't know that I wasn't getting emails. So I was like, for a while I was like in this dry spell and I was like, I'm not getting any emails or like writing opportunities or anything like that. And it's weird. I just felt like, um, I was so confused by that, but then a bunch of people were like, Hey, I've been emailing you and I haven't gotten a response. And I was like, well, I haven't gotten an email. Um, and so the, my friend and the person who designed my website, um, like went in and, and fixed a couple of things and, found out that I had like emails that dated back like five, six months. Um, and part of, of those emails was um, an email from 
my now editor of the the publishing house uh, that I published with. And they were, you know, requesting that I like write a book or wondering if I had any idea about like um, what I would want to write if I was to write a book. So we had a conversation at the end of 2019. Gratefully, the opportunity was still on the table. Um, I was like amazed that this was something that for one, I had just missed. Um, and that also that it was something that they were still interested in. Uh, and so in the beginning of 2020, actually, uh, just a couple of days before or like around the same time we went into like quarantine around the pandemic is when I signed my contract. Right. is when I signed my contract for the book. Um, and so like I didn't anticipate writing a book in the middle of of all that happened in 2020. <laughs> but um, that was sort of like the the conception of of the idea and sort of how I arrived to writing the book and um and it's, it has it's been like a, a roller coaster it's been up and down you know I was writing this book in the middle of the pandemic in the middle of the uprisings that were happening in the middle of like mutual aid or organizing work and and last year at the time I was working two jobs so I was like doing both of those jobs while writing this book, while organizing and trying to like <laughs> keep whatever bit of mental health I have, like, right. Like it was just like all over the place. And I was like, girl, is this book going to get written? Find out. <laughs> we will find out soon enough. Um, but it got written. Uh, it happened. And, um, and yeah, the first week has been overwhelming, but, I'm also overjoyed by like the response to, to the book and um, the interest in the book and just, you know, like the, the words I've, I've, I've heard from folks who have read even part of the book, not even read the full book yet, but um, just like the, the, the care that the book is being held with for the most part just feels um, absolutely amazing. So I'm like, I'm grateful for that roller coaster, and I'm grateful for like the conditions under which I wrote the book because I think that um, it's making this moment right now like um, that much better for me, and, and something that I'm able to appreciate even more. Yeah, I agree. And as someone who also started to take my writing seriously during the middle of a pandemic, I feel you in the roller coaster ride that it has been to, you know, actually sit down and focus in the midst of everything that's going on. But I will tell you, I appreciate you so much for working on this because this book, when I say I read it in two days, I couldn't put it down because it not only was a great read from start to finish, very educational, but it also challenged me in the way that I think and the way that not that I perceive people, but the way that I want to interact with other people and the conversation that I want to continue having. And it gave me the language. You spoke a little earlier how when you were first coming up with the idea and you were first introduced to the topic, there wasn't a lot of language or resources around it. And I found that in my work as well, trying to, you know, discuss more experiences of what the Black, queer, trans, and non-binary looks like for people. There's not a lot of resources out there and there's not wording to go with the experiences that we endure and the, the, the people that we engage with and how we are represented and interacted with and engaged with. It's, it's a lot. So I'm glad that you were able to actually put it on paper, <laughs> put it in words <laughs> in a way that help people actually understand what these experiences look like, not just for you, but for other people across these communities as well. No, thank you so much. Um, that really means a lot. And, and yeah, like it, <laughs> I'm grateful that it got written too, but really it was, it was that, that kept me going Was there was like so many um, Black folks in general, but particularly the Black fat folks who, you know, knew I was writing this book and who were just so interested in, in having the book in their hands. And it was it was that that pushed me to, to keep going because I was going to try to find every resource that I could to pay back that advance and was going to call it a day because <laughs> I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. This, this year is just so hellish, but it worked out and, and I'm grateful because of, of, 
words that you just offered, like that, that made it all worth it for me. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I keep saying I'm grateful, but it's because I really am. And I don't even know how else to describe it besides the fact that I'm just very grateful. Yeah, I understand that. And I remember even, uh, I think it was a live that you had did one time where you were talking about the details of the book and you was like, y'all, I'm sorry, but it's it's only going to be like a little bit over 100 pages, but it's still going to be worth it. And I was like, oh, I need to get this book. <laughs> you was watching the lives. Look, oh, now, yes. now oh, I, <laughs> I am like, now you had to be uh, a low-key OG Twitter follower for real because people, Twitter don't let me do lives anymore, unfortunately. Um, That's what so I'm I saying. love that. I was, when you were describing, I was like, okay, this is something that I'm not only intrigued in right now, but I know that when the final product comes out, it's definitely going to be worth the discussion amongst everybody. And I know that everybody's been talking about it and have been sharing their insights and sharing what they've learned from it. So I'm glad that it's actually being put out there for people. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm like, Yes, I love that. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. So I did see the interview that you did with Good Morning LA, and there's a quote that you had shared with them that I want to just kind of bring to our space here. Mm-hmm. And so you said, there are many of us that live at these margins all at once, and there is no way for us to live separate lives at one time. So we have to be able to find a way to hold all of these identities at one time so that we can acknowledge the way that folks are being mostly marginalized. And that to me was a synopsis of the book and what the book embodied discussing anti-fatness and anti-blackness and what it looks like for gender expression and for thinness and for what it looks like for other people to be able to look into these spaces and have more conversations with these people. So I just want to just kind of pick your brain at how you came up with the idea of the concept to continue to address the interpersonal and systemic issues within our society, but in the way that you put them in the book. Yeah. Um, so I, I told you about how I like got into fat studies and, and like how I discovered that in 2017, but um, I like got more interested in black studies um, I actually don't know when, like, I can't pinpoint an exact sort of time period when that happened, but it was later than fat studies when I actually like started to actually read and um, and process what black studies was and what it was offering. Um, and then, and while I was in school um, at, at Morehouse, um, we worked a lot, or I was around a lot of folks who were like, um, in women, gender, and sexuality studies um, disciplines. And so when I started to write the book, I was like, you know, each of these, these disciplines or, or topics or, or, or groups um, offer something very special and very important. And each of them in some ways, like, are talking about an experience that I'm moving through. And they are also very separate disciplines. They're very separate um, like conversations that are happening, but there are a lot of people in the world who are just like me, who are moving through all these identities at one time too. And there's no way for us to, to separate ourselves into, dif- into disciplines, right? There's no way for me to one day show up um, as black and then one day show up as fat and then one day show up as trans, right? Like that all happens at, at one time. And so I wanted to make a multidisciplinary intervention um, in the ways that like these, these concepts are sort of compartmentalized or, or separated and not then allowed to, to sort of like make room for um, the full embodiment of a being um, and the ways that we show up in the world. Um, And so that was sort of like what led to what led to me um, writing the book in the way that that I did. And I knew that like, particularly in fat studies, that 99.999% of what's written is about cis women. 
Uh, and I was like, well, I'm not a cis woman. And there are a lot of people in the world who are not cis women who are experiencing like a very particular type of violence um, at the hand of anti-blackness by way of anti-fatness. And I think that that has to be explored, further explored. Um, and so I'm going to do that by bringing in black studies and by, by bringing in um, women, gender and sexuality studies um, and their subgroups like trans studies and queer studies um, because there is something that each of them offer individually that have to be brought together to be able to like write the book that I want to write. So that kind of is the, is the backstory for that and kind of how I arrived at, you know, making this um, an intervention that would, that would cover all three of those, of those disciplines and not just be about an individual um, like topic, I guess. Yeah. And like you even said, you can't have conversations about these individual identities and not discuss the other, even how you mentioned in the book, the disparities in healthcare and the lies that the government was telling people and homelessness and sex work and all of these other experiences that come along with these different identities. We can't right. ignore we can't have conversations about who we are authentically as people and not discuss the things that we go through or all of yes. the smaller identities that are a part of who we are. So I was glad to to learn more about that because that was something that I wasn't knowledgeable of just because of the media, just, you know, forcing, forcing lies everywhere. <laughs> Literally, like, no, a lot of people are not aware of that, right? Like, um, I think so far, some of like the, the, um, I guess hype that I've gotten around the book has been around chapter five, where people are like, whoa, this connection between the war on drugs and the war on obesity is something that I've not ever written about or seen written about before. And it's like, yeah, of course not. Like, because, because media government science is designed so that that type of thing is, is not written. Um, and I think that like, it's, it's special that people are, are, are clear, or at least becoming clear on the ways that those two things do overlap and how in general, like how that sort of tells of a story um, of the ways that like fat black folks are, are engaged across the spectrum every single day um, in, 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 in any iteration of, of, of that violence, right? Whether it's through media or science or government or whatever, right? The ways that they are set up to harm us and 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 to like profit from our oppression. Yeah, and not a lot of people are there. I would say mentally, but a lot of people aren't there to be able to critique these different things that are being put out there in the public, or to be able to have a deeper understanding of the different stories that people right. are. I had even read one of your older articles um, about Lucifer and what that has looked like for Black men and how it relates to Black fathers abandoning them. And I was like, I've never considered this before, but it, it intrigued me. It made me think, think deeper on the topic and what that, how it relates and kind of what that means for a lot of other people that feel these certain ways. So I, I do appreciate and just... And another way, another reason why I enjoy reading your work, because it continues to challenge me and the way that I think, the way that I read things and interpret them and even see the world. So it's definitely it's definitely needed, um, especially amongst the world that we're in today. So just kind of going based off of the current world that we're in and the current critiques on critical race theory and diversity and inclusion work that's going on within the government, within academia and everywhere. Do you think that the impact, let me rephrase this, will the impact, will that, so the current critiques of it impact the progression of research rooted in anti-blackness and anti-fatness? So I think that this is, uh, um, especially with it being a newer topic. Right. I think that this is like a, a, a tough question for me to answer because I have my own critiques of critical race theory. Um, and, and though, of course, 
<laughs> no critique that's rooted in 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 like white supremacist logics or anti-blackness can ever be like valid critique. So I, I want to say that first, right? Like I'm not offering validity to any of the people who are who are critiquing it now because it's not rooted in in like a liberatory practice or praxis. Um, but I do think that you know critical race theory itself is. It, it works to, in so many ways, legitimize the law um, or at least try to offer uh, a, a lens of, of dehumanization to people who cannot, who have never been understood as human. Um, and, and as such, right, I think sort of offers like, maybe even inadvertently, um, some sort of validity to, to criminality and to the law. Uh, and, and, and so I, I have my, my own critiques of, of, of that and of, you know, intersectionality. Um, and I guess Kimberly Crenshaw more generally, but despite that fact, I think that, you know, the, the critiques that are happening now around that, I don't think that, that they will necessarily, um, halt um, any particular work around anti-Blackness or anti-fatness because I think that those conversations are happening in two different realms, right? I think that the folks who are who are having conversations about or offer critiques around um, critical race theory are not people who, who are having the same conversations that are particular to anti-Blackness and anti-fatness, right? Um, and so I think that they will have a larger like impact on conversations around race for sure and racism. Um, but I don't think that that conversations on anti-blackness will be um, necessarily like disrupted because they're they're not happening in the same spaces. Um, nor are they producing sort of the same conversations in the first place, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So what I'm hearing is we need to keep talking about this. <laughs> right. Literally. That's basically it. Conversations, look, disrupt the picnic table. Let's talk about this. <laughs> right. Literally. <laughs> so with this current work that you're doing and even within the past work that you've done with editing and writing articles and everything, is this your niche? Have you found this to be your niche or is this just kind of one of your many areas that you continue to dive into? Writing, um, you know, <laughs> so everybody, so, got, everybody got their space, got, got your niche, what you're right. writing about. So I love writing, right? Like I, I love writing. And what I've discovered is that doing this like for a living versus doing it as a passion sort of like takes the desire away from, from you, right? Where now you don't write just because you want to write and because you're passionate about it, but you write because you have to, to make some sort of money, to make a living. Um, and there, there is not um, a, a huge living being made um, in writing these days, unless you are already like a very rich or very popular person, um, by which I mean a celebrity. Um, and I am not right. So it's like um, I'm, <laughs> I'm writing to um, to to make a to, to make enough money to be able to to live off of to survive. Um, but with what comes with the type of writing that I'm doing, you know, the 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 backlash and and the the bad faith arguments and and whatnot. I think that it it sort of takes away my ability to look at it as worth it um, because it doesn't feel like it, right? It feels like, you know, I, you are barely making the money that you need to survive and dealing with people who want to make your blood pressure go skyrocket, um, you know, like, and it, and it just sometimes feels like it maybe is not worth it. So I, but I know that it is. I know that it's worth it in the long run. And so I guess I would say that, yes, this is like my niche. This is what 
I, I want to do for the rest of my life, what I, what I feel compelled to do, what I feel called to do um, for, for the rest of my life and, and, and with the rest of my life. And I, I wonder how, I often wonder how that is like disrupted by capitalism and anti-Blackness and, and this sort of ability to, or inability to find balance in, in like work for survival and producing work that you're passionate about. Um, and so I'm still, I'm still looking and working and trying for that. And, and I guess I, I'll have a better answer in five years when, when I know for sure. But I, I do know like that this is um, what I want to do and, um, and, and how I want to keep, keep going within my career. So, so we will see where that lands me in five, 10, 15 years. But um, for now, this is this is where I'm at. Okay, I'll be checking back in. <laughs> uh, I expect you to, so I'll wait for it. <laughs> Do you think that it would be easier or that, I guess, the topic would be more attractable to people if you collaborated more with others? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I, I think, like... I said that again. All about building community. It is, and and I have have been able to build so much like um, brilliant, amazing community with like, with folks who are writing in 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 fat studies and black studies and gender studies, um, who are producing amazing work, and um, and I think that there's like a collaborative effort happening like on Twitter where all of us are like pulling off of each other's thoughts and, and, and writing threads from each other's thoughts and citing each other in our threads and stuff like that, um, that I think is, is amazing. I don't think that we, that we ever see a lot of collaborative work happening in, in like prose writing in general, especially when it's nonfiction and, um, and, and when it's theory, I don't think that we ever see a lot of like collaboration. Um, and, but what I also know is that I am very much someone who is invested in like non-traditional ways of, of, of writing and, and showing up in our writing. So um, that is to say like, you know, maybe there, there, there will be more collaborative work happening um, in the future. I don't know. I think, um, I think that would depend on the person or persons I would be collaborating with, right? You know, their writing and their writing style, their writing ability, um, but also the ways that we are thinking together. I think that um, there are a lot of people whose work I value, but I don't think that we're thinking together necessarily. Um, and I think that collaborating in that way then would, would make it um, sort of impossible. But I'm open to it. I'm, I'm all, like, I'm very open to, to writing with others. I, I've written a couple of pieces with other people, notably one of my really good friends, um, Josh. Um, and we've written like two or three pieces together and it was fun. It was like an exciting thing, but I think it has to be somebody who's writing I trust and who, and whose thinking is aligned with mine. So, you know, if it comes along, I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, and I'm and I'm ready to embrace it with open arms. Yeah, because perspective is huge, especially going yeah. into something where you want to be intentional in the message that you get across to people. And writing is a only is a very vulnerable process. Very. You have to really dig deep into who you are as a person, the values that you have, and the values that you want to per portray to other people. Not that that necessarily matters, but you want right. to. Always show up authentically so at what point in your life or your career did you kind of rip the vulnerability band-aid off and just say fuck it and start speaking your truth um i i have never run away from vulnerability i think that's always been like my um well, depending on who you ask, my greatest weakness or my greatest strength um, is that I like I run towards vulnerability like like it's candy. <laughs> um, and I and I welcome it. And, and, you know, part of it is because I'm a cancer. 
And I also think that that a lot of it is because of, of trauma. I think a lot of folks, you know, they lock they lock in um, or, or keep bottled up, you know, like things because of their trauma. But for me, my trauma has always sort of led me to, to releasing um, everything and being very honest and open and vulnerable and truthful about what I'm experiencing. Um, and so to like to that end, I think <sighs> vulnerability like in, in my writing and, and outside of writing has always just been who I am. And it's something that I, that I welcome um, because not only do I think that the best writers are, are, are beings who are willing and able to allow themselves to be vulnerable, but also I think the, the best learning for, for both folks, the writer and the person who's reading, um, I, I think that that vulnerability allows for 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 both to be able to learn in a way that that's impossible to do if you're not allowing yourself to be vulnerable as a reader and as a writer. So, um, yeah, I, I've always been a very vulnerable person, um, and I think I will always be a vulnerable person. And it will how how it affects me depends on the space environment and and how genuine somebody is. Um, when reading my work or when engaging me as like a, a friend or a romantic partner or a sex partner, whatever, like it depends, de depends entirely on like our relationship. Um, but, but I think that um, it has always been like a very um, important part of my life and something that I'm not willing to compromise on. That's good. I'm glad that you have that. And I'm glad that you're able to exude that to everyone else because more people need to be vulnerable. We need to learn how to not even see vulnerability as vulnerability, but just as being ourselves. And that's a, yeah. a, a in society is that we we see vulnerability as one a weakness, but also as something that's very hard to attain when in reality it's just you being you. And just so. allowing yourself to to open up and be honest with yourself and with others. But I think it starts with being honest with yourself. I, I don't think a lot of us are very honest with ourselves. And I think that sort of like is what leads us to being afraid of being vulnerable with others. Yeah. And you talked about that a lot in the book is the aspect of vulnerability and even insecurity and what that looks like for not just people looking into our lives, but how we perceive our lives to be and how we interact with other people or engage with other people based on that. So it's 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 a, again a roller coaster, <laughs> right? It is, but thank you for for hopping on and, and taking it with me. <laughs> no problem, anytime. So, with the book, is there any part of I know it's your work, so you're probably very critical, but also love it, especially in this moment. But is there any part or any quote that is your favorite right now that you wrote? Mm. I got to pull it out. Get, go back to your sticky notes to highlight. I have to like. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know. For one, I have not read the book since I finished it um, in, in, in its entirety. Of course, I've read like chapters for like chapter readings and I've read like excerpts for um, like the last couple of talks that I've done for the book tour. But um, I haven't like read the book from front to back since I wrote it. And so I don't even, I don't know that there's like a quote. I, I think that I am a great writer. Um, and I think that I'm, I'm able to, to um, write in, in a way that, that sort of like makes pulling quotes kind of easy. Um, because uh, like the writing is like more poetic in a way. Um, so I will I will give myself like that, but I don't I don't know that there's a particular quote. I'm looking over there at my bookshelf, like at the book as if it's gonna pop out. Um somewhere floating in the air. Right. <laughs> but I don't think that there's like a quote that at least not that immediately comes to mind that I just like am so in love with. But I'm gonna read it again and 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 I'll 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 message you directly, like, hey, this is my favorite quote, I think. 
Okay, I'll share it. <laughs> <laughs> so going with the book, I'm not going to um, touch on the book, but I also read another article that was kind of related to the topic of the book. And I just kind of want to ask your thoughts on this. So mm-hmm. in an article for them publication in 2018, the, the Daily Realities of Being Fat, Black, and Queer in Public Spaces, you said, when you think you have done everything in your power to aid fat people in our fight against oppression, know that you haven't. And when you have exhausted all other options, ask fat people, how can you show up for them? So I want to ask just in our space, how can I and everybody else who's tuned in continue to show up for the fat people in our lives and around the world and continue to support them? Yeah. So I think that this answer is twofold. Um, I think that more generally, I think the 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 answer is to um, what I've been saying in, in interviews for the last um, couple of, uh, well, for the last week, um, is that I wrote an essay last year in the middle of the uprisings. Um, more, 99% of the time when I write, I'm, I'm writing to Black folks. I'm not writing to non-Black folks. Um, and, and they may read it, but they're not my audience. Not for you. But there are a couple of times in my career that I've like written specifically to write white folks and last year I wrote an article to white folks on whiteness and on like um, the, the, the need to abolish whiteness. Uh, and actually, I don't even think that that was necessarily to white folks. I was just writing to write. But the, the end of the, of the piece was to white folks. And it was sort of addressing the question um, of how to be a better ally. And I was like, well, for one, I don't believe in allyship. Um, but the the answer is there's only three answers there's give money to black folks house and 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 provide resources for black folks and be willing to give up your own life right like take this fight to the streets yourselves um that is that that is how you show up for black folks and so in that same way that is what i believe is the call for 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 folks to show up for fat folks but what i also believe is that it means being honest with yourself and being more intentional about interrogating um, the the ways that you that you show up and the ways that that you are are sort of in, engaging with or not engaging with fat folks, right? Particularly in Black queer spaces, I think that a lot of folks befriend people who are desirable. Right. Um, they 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 befriend people who who are are not politically ugly, who are not um, conventionally unattractive. And I hate that language, but that's a term that a lot of people use. Um, and and and, you know. Try to, to 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 make their friend group as 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 beautiful with the capital B as possible. Um, and when they do befriend, befriend people who are politically ugly or who are fat, um, et cetera, uh, they, they do so be, to make their, their fat friend, their one fat friend, you know, like the one who provides humor to the group or the one who is like an advice giver and a counselor to the group, but not somebody who gets to be their, their full self, their whole self within that space. And so I think that, um, it means being honest about how you show up in 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 like in these spaces and and how you engage fat folks or don't engage fat folks do you have fat friends and if if you do have fat friends are they allowed to be their full selves and not just somebody that you go to for advice or not just somebody who you go to for their intellectual capacity or not just somebody that you go to for a laugh but that they get to be their whole self around you and with you and and you are also a friend to, as much of a friend to them as they are to you right it also means though like being honest about your sexual attractions if you are somebody who experiences sexual attraction right like what what do your sex partners look like have they been fat do you have any interest in fat folks do you have any like any any interest in in interrogating why you are not attracted to fat folks or if you are are you interested in in assessing how much of that attraction is actual attraction versus fetishizing their bodies right like all of that matters um you know like and I, i think that way too many people 
are unwilling to interrogate those things, particularly, and it's not unique to, but but it is particular to, because that's what I'm speaking to directly right now, um, particularly with Black queer spaces. I think that so much about our spaces are, are built on um, sexual attraction and are therefore like, not inclusive of um, people who are not generally, more generally deemed to be sexually attractive. Um, but also people don't want to interrogate or engage why they think that fat folks or dark skin folks or trans folks or disabled folks are not attractive, right? Um, and so then, you know, the people who, who get to build queer community in a very particular way. Uh, and actually, I, I don't I don't know that it, that I would say it's queer community so much as I think it's um, LGBT community or or black gay community. Um, and I'm, I'm using that to be specific because I think that because of how I define queerness, I don't I don't think I would define these spaces as queer, but there's not really room to build space and community in these in these spaces um, because they are they are built with light skin thin um you know like able-bodied people in mind um, and then when they are inclusive of other of other folks they very rarely are inclusive of um of fat folks and disabled folks and and so i think you know it's really being mindful of 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 that fact because Statistically, the people who are sitting in positions of power to be able to employ folks, to house folks, to to diagnose folks and things like that are the people who are thin, who who have a particular level of desire capital that fat folks do not. And so therefore, your sexual attractions, if you're someone if you're someone who experiences sexual attraction, um, help define the way that fat folks are treated outside of just like the ways that we're engaged sexually or not engaged sexually. But also I think it's dishonest to, to assert that like sexuality is not a, a big part of how so many people engage the world. So it's important still, even if you're not somebody who, who has like, you know, a position of power or whatever, it's important still to interrogate that because that that is, you know, determining people's entire dating pools and how they're engaged in, in queer community um, and in black community and in black queer community. And, and it matters. So I think overall it's about, you know, those three rules around, you know, housing folks, giving giving or resourcing folks, giving money to folks and and being willing to give up your life on, on, on the behalf of their struggle, but also deeply interrogating your own relationship to to fat people um, and why you do or do not have one and, and what it looks like in, in some of the more, more intimate parts of your lives, because I think that is where, you know, the the, the intimate, the interpersonal spaces is, is where a lot of us fail. Um, to to recognize fat folks as whole beings um, and not just political concepts that we can use in our talking points um, and ignore in our own personal lives. Whew, you just dropped so many gems. <laughs> and I hope that everybody that is out there watching and listening that you all go back and replay that so that you can hear it again because it was a much needed piece of advice and I know that you you say that writers shouldn't give vi advice to people but that was some much needed advice and it was the way that you ended only on writing <laughs> only in writing but that was definitely it was the way that you ended the book as well with those three rules so it was something tangible that people can take with them although we do need to destroy the the structures and the system right. in order to accomplish this goal but those are three tangible things that you can do yeah. to help these different communities so out with writing, I know that you said you shouldn't give advice within writing, but what has been some of the best and worst advice that you've ever received? I like this question. Um, I talk about this a lot be because it just like it baffles me um, that this is. Anyway, so I think some of the worst experience or worst advice I've gotten from from people is to not edit as you go, um, to just write out all of your thoughts and let them flow and then edit at the end. I think that's cute, right? Some people, it works for some people. It does not work for me. 
I cannot like, I cannot finish writing what I, what I need to write. If I feel like I left something unedited or unfinished or, or not fully fleshed out. Um, and so, you know, for, for some people that would be their best advice, right. To, to, <laughs> to like write out all their thoughts and not edit what they're, what they're writing. But for me, that was the worst advice because it slows down my writing process. It slows down my thinking. Um, and it, it makes me more frustrated than anything else. And I'm not allowed to like, um, sort of like finish my, my train of thought. And, and now I'm like having to like go back over what I was thinking and figure out what I was trying to write and everything else, because I, I need to be able to like f flesh out what I'm writing first before I like, um, can keep going with what, with what I'm trying to finish. So that was, I think it's the worst advice I've gotten. Um, and I think maybe the best advice that I've gotten from folks, um, I mean, I I've gotten like really great. <laughs> oh my goodness. I don't know that I've gotten really great writing advice. Like I don't, I haven't gotten a lot of advice from people on writing, um, not on purpose. But because, well, for a couple of reasons, I think that one, like starting in 2014, you know, like being a freelancer made so much about this competitive. And so people like were competing to like get bylines and, and, and opportunities and not like really trying to build each other up. Uh, and so like I got into the game like later than a lot of other folks in terms of like publishing my writing. And so by the time I started writing, a lot of folks were not trying to offer advice. They were trying to like get their bylines built. And it was like every person for themselves. Um, but I, I guess like over the years, there have been a few folks who have like offered some very generative um, advice, even if, it's, if, even if it's advice that I don't use now um, and advice that maybe I can't even think of right now, but like people who have been very supportive of my writing, like George Johnson and um, like my coworker Sharonda and Lara, um, I think have always been like very, very like nice and generative when it comes to offering advice around writing for me. Um, and then like my friends like Justin James and, um, and my friend Antoinette who designed my website, um, they offer great advice too. A lot of times, not necessarily on on writing, at least not from Justin's. And Justin's will tell you in a heartbeat that he is not a writer and will not offer me writing advice. But um, just like great advice on on things surrounding writing, like brand building and and, and publishing and things like that. Um, but yeah, like there's nothing like particular that comes to mind about like this outstanding writing advice that I've gotten, which is also kind of why I'm like, I don't think that writers should give, <laughs> should give other writers advice because we all show up in our like processes and like our abilities very differently. And when we try to like do what others do by emulating them, not only do we fail at it because we're emulating somebody who is not us, um, but also it like, I think sort of like stops us from being able to find our own voice and determine what it is that that makes up who we are as a writer and 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 what like sort of like um, best benefits us. Um, but I, what I will say is and this is not advice given directly to me, obviously, um, but it is advice that has helped me along the way. Um, Tony Morrison once said that um, if there's a book that hasn't been written that you want to, to read, you should write it. Um, and that advice is what led to me writing Belly of the Beast. So I, I will say why it wasn't advice given to me directly. It like has been, I think, some of the most beneficial advice I've, I've ever read um, and has led to me publishing my debut title. So, yeah. <laughs> I love it. And I love that because that is also the, the premise of the Closet Unlocked. It was it was a conversation that I felt needed to be had. It was those moments that we didn't share with the public, that we didn't discuss with ourselves, that 
needed to be talked about in order for us to heal, in order for us to understand everybody else's experiences. So I resonate with that as well. And if you've never heard any advice before, any great advice, I'm going to just say keep going, keep writing about what you write write, write what you're writing about, doing what you're doing because it's needed. Your art, your work, your writing is definitely needed. And it is shown from the time that you started till now. <laughs> it's something that people have continued to gravitate towards and continue to receive and understand. I think that the more that you continue to write, the more people are able to understand not only you, but what these experiences look like for everyone. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. You are the sweetest. Thank you so much. Like, um, I, 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 I always need that. Right. I sometimes I'm like, do I need to keep writing? Like, do I need to like, keep yes, going? Keep like, going. I don't know. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to keep going because Darius told me to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for just talking about your book and your experience as a writer. And as always, we love to end all of our interviews talking about those positive moments. And, you know, so maybe some of those funny moments or inspirational things that have just helped us continue to grow as the people that we are and have contributed to the spaces that we're able to enter in and create for ourselves and for other people. So is there any moment in your life that you have used as kind of like a building block or something that has propelled you with your confidence, with love, with your knowledge, anything like that? Um, I think, so kind of, right? I think like, There, I don't like know exactly when, but there was a moment for me where um, things sort of shifted for me um, in terms of confidence and, and things like that. And I, I think it was around the time that I discovered Fat Studies where I felt like a bad bitch and nobody could tell me otherwise. <laughs> And once that moment came, I was like, I'm sorry. Like, y'all can't tell me shit. Like, this is me. This is what y'all gonna get. This is what y'all gonna get. I'm dropping these news on the timeline. I'm like, I'm I I'm feeling like my body, myself, my being, like, um, and it and and it and it changed everything for me. It like it allowed me to show up for myself in a way that I had always wanted to, but but never could because I just wasn't confident enough. Um, and I don't know, I think it was like in 2018, like winter break, um, I I was just like, I started writing manifestations for the first time, um, like at that point and like, I was just determined to just be in, to have a different reality, to be living in a very different, um, space and it, it changed everything for me. And so now I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm writing with, with confidence that I've never had before. And I'm, I'm showing up with confidence that I've never had before. And I, I'm like posting thirst traps on my timeline and, and doing the things because I feel sexy. Fire. I feel, what'd you say? Fire. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I feel sexy. I feel confident. I feel happy in this body. I feel glad about this body. And, and, you know, like nobody can tell me otherwise and nobody can tell me that I can't be or that I shouldn't be because bitch I am. So like, no, like there's nothing else that, that can be said or done. And, um, yeah, like I think that that was a moment for me. 2018, I, I'm going to I'm going to call it. It was December 2018 when I started writing manifestations. N you know, people do New Year's resolutions. For me, it was New Year uh, manifestations um, where I wasn't like just writing things on paper and like making goals. I was like writing things down and, and talking to my ancestors about manifesting this this thing for my life and these things for my life. Um, and they came, um, and I remember like writing those manifestations and then posting my, my first thirst traps ever on the timeline. And from that moment forward, 
everything changed for me. So I like I know that I, I know that a lot of people for a lot of people. Um, sometimes like thirst traps and nudes and stuff are just sexual. And for the most part for me, they are too, but they also are like, they, they help build my, my confidence. I feel like if I can like take these pictures and, and these videos and like, and, and feel myself in the way that I want to feel myself, I feel so confident and so happy. And so like, once I started taking those and doing that and, and sharing them with the world and, and, and wanting to share them with whoever wanted to look like, it changed everything for me. Um, and yeah, and, and that, and that shows up in how I like navigate life in general, not just with the, with the thirst traps and stuff now, but like that confidence spilled over into everything else that I do. Um, and I think that's the best part about all of this is that it allowed younger me would be so happy about where I am now um, in terms of my confidence and, and what I'm allowing myself to do and how I'm allowing myself to show up. So yeah, I think that was, that's my answer. Like it changed everything. <laughs> I love that for you. And I love that you have been able to welcome yourself into this place of comfortability, not right. find comfortability, but welcome your, yourself into this place of comfortability. To yeah. Just- love everything and not think twice about it that's that's what it's all about and not as an not just as an adult but we need to have more conversations with the youth about this and teach them how to do it and not teach them but just welcome them into this from birth so yeah. they deserve it they do they do and they they deserve it the people under them deserve it the people yes. above them they might be able to teach them something <laughs> now Listen, it's necessary. <laughs> when kids are schooling us on this climate change. Right. It's different. <laughs> it is. Gen Z, they, they got us on lock. They, they do. Us up. They really do. They are, they are eating us up. <laughs> Left and <or> right. <laughs> so last question, going with comfortability, kind of throw you off for a little bit. Okay. Is there anything, one thing, two things in your closet that makes you feel that the most comfortable, that makes you feel like a bad bitch? Ooh, I love this question. Absolutely, yes. Um, So one, um, and last year I started getting like more into like um, wearing heels and like loving them. And so um, there's like this, huh? Click clack. I love a I love a cute click clack. I really do. I absolutely do. It's I love a good click clack. Uh, and so there's this one pair of like um, six inch heels that I have in my closet um, that are like that they're leather and I love them. And whenever I put them on, I feel like I'm in the six inch video with Beyonce in the weekend. And I was just gonna ask, was this Beyonce inspired? Absolutely, it absolutely was. And you can't oh, tell me yeah. <laughs> you can't tell me shit in those because not only like, first of all, I'm a natural. I put them on for the first time and walked around and like it was nothing. And I'm not saying that you know I'm special, but I think I'm special. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but like I, I, I think like what feels so empowering about those for me is like the the young the young version of me who was like hiding their queerness and like not able to like fully embrace who they were and and like didn't have the language to describe themselves as as trans and like all of that like just feels so affirmed and being able to like happily show up however I want to in, in this body and wear the things that I couldn't wear before that I wasn't allowed to wear that that I, I would have been in so many words, abused for, for wearing as a kid. And so those, those shoes, they do every, they do it all for me. And then like, um, just in general, I have, my closet is full of boots. Um, like the brunch boots, the, the combat boots, the, like, um, the heels, like all, like a, a, a variety of boots that I just love. And I, I feel so confident in them and like, um, just love the way they make me feel. I don't know. I just, I love it. So that's number one. Number two, um, I have a closet full of crop tops and I love, I actually have on one right now. Um, <laughs> myself, uh-huh. <laughs> order myself. 
and do. Um, but, but actually, all of them are are crop tops that I I cut. I made myself because they were like just again, 2020 was like it was a hard year, but it was also a a year for me where I was able to really find pieces of myself that that weren't lost, but that I just chose to ignore. Uh, and so. I was like, I mean, you like you posting all these things online and whatnot. What's wrong with wearing a crop top? Like, it's the same thing. In fact, you're more clothed in a crop top than you are without a crop top. So, so I cut up my very first crop top and I loved it. I just like felt so free uh, and like I, I at first for so long I didn't wear them because when they were worn. They were usually worn by women. And when they weren't worn by women, they were worn by cis men who were muscular or thin. I'm not a cis man. I'm not muscular. I'm not thin. So I was like, and I'm, I'm not a cis woman. So I was like, I don't like, I don't know how comfortable I feel about this. But once I like wore my first one, I was like, y'all got me fucked up. So I cut up like five, six different t-shirts and made them into crop tops. And I love them. I, I feel like very confident and happy in 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 them, and um, I, I they excite me. Uh, and so yeah, like that's number two. And then I think I know you said three things. So I think if I had to say one more thing that was in my closet that just like makes me feel like a bad bitch, it is. Okay, I'm I, I'm gonna name a number of things. That's number three. Okay. <laughs> but, like a few things came to my mind. One, I wear a lot of jewelry now, um, like necklaces, rings, bracelets, and that like they feel like I I love it. Like walking around with like like these nice ass clothes on and then being able to accessorize it like I'll, a hand full of rings or both hands full of rings, a necklace. Like I love it. And if somebody snatch it, they won't be taking nothing but like $8 from me because they are all cheap, but I feel so like so good in them. And I'm like, I love this. Like it feels, it feels nice. I love it. So that's like one thing. I also have, um, this Caroline Herrera, um, um, perfume in my, or cologne perfume whichever one in my closet too that I wear all the time and wearing it like I feel um hella sexy and like because it just smells so good so I'm like the smell like I can snatch somebody up with this like I love it um so that's another one and then I was also going to say um I, I have like a bunch of shorts in my closet um, like the thought shorts that people call them where they're like above the knee sure, yeah. um, <laughs> because like, no, I used to, I used to love wearing shorts when I was younger and I stopped wearing them not for any reason in particular, but I, I think maybe subconsciously I like, I got, I got bigger and like, I stopped wearing shorts, but then I literally love my thighs. I do. And so I started wearing like, shorter shorts and like and now i the only shorts i wear have to be above my knee um so because the other ones are ugly they're ugly they're <laughs> not cute it's like why are you wearing these like it's given very 2005 yeah. and I, i'm not feeling it like i need something cute so yeah I, like if you're gonna wear shorts make them above the knee. I, fuck gender norms, fuck like beauty standards, all of that. They have to be above the knee. And I think anyone who wears them, I think it's sexy. I really do. Um, so yeah, I love it. So that's like, that's my top three, like things in my closet that like make me feel very confident and, and just like excite me when I get to put them on. It sounds like you got a closet full of confidence to me. And I do. <laughs> I really do. I, I was able to, to build it. I didn't have this closet two years ago. Um, but now, like, once I got comfortable wearing stuff like that I wouldn't normally wear, I was like, put this shit in your closet and, and, and make that your entire wardrobe. And so now my entire wardrobe is stuff that I'm happy about. Mesh shirts, see-through shirts and crop tops and shorts and some like nice like fitted jeans and boots I, all of that i love it and 
You can't tell me shit and none of that. <laughs> it's really about getting there. Once you find what you feel comfortable in, once you find what you love to wear, what mm-hmm. makes you feel good about yourself, it's over with. Because now you can't. Now you got endless possibilities. Exactly. And you you walk with a different walk. You talk with a different talk. <laughs> like it changes your whole like demeanor. And and that's what it's about. Like you said. Like that's what it's all about. And I, I think everyone. Everyone deserves to feel like that confident in their body um, and that happy in their body. Like if we all got to walk around feeling like that every single day, I think the world could be a better place. I think it would be too. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Like I said, from the beginning, I was very excited to chat with you and you delivered You brought me everything that I was looking for, plus more. So I'm hoping that everybody else was able to receive the messages here. And I hope that they read the book. Y'all, I will say, got a little surprise for y'all. Got a little discount for the book. If you haven't bought it yet, I will put the promo code in the details below and share that across everything. But that's just more encouragement for y'all to go and get this book, like, When I tell you, it was definitely worth the read. It was very educational, very enlightening. And it helped you understand more about not only yourself, but about life and the government, if you want to know more about them. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But again, thank you so much, Deshaun, for just being here and being in our space and bringing so much of your light to it. Thank you for having me. It was like literally a, a pleasure. Like, it was great. So thank you. No problem. Well, before we end, is there anything else that you want to leave with the people or you want to share your socials or your website with them, to especially to go find the book? Yes. Um, so you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Deshaun L-H, D-A-S-H-A-U-N-L-H. Um, you can find me on TikTok at the same, actually. <laughs> and um, and my website is DeshaunHarrison.com. In my bio for Every platform, you will find my link tree, and that's where you can find like where to order the book. You can find talks that I've given over the book over the course of the book tour thus far. Um, you can also find links to like um, book talk events coming up that you might want to register for and show up to. Um, all that is there, and as well as other like um, socials and things of that nature. Yes, y'all. The celebrity is on a is on a world tour, so make Please. sure y'all <laughs> make sure you catch their other appearances. I'm sure they will be as worthwhile as this one was. So, Thank get, you. enjoyed it, and y'all know we'll be back next time talking with more Black queer folks being represented at the table. But until then, peace out. Peace.